It's Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, a land of make-believe. Won't you ride along with me? Ride along. Do 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 do. Good evening, neighbors. I hope you're having a good day today. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. It was a beautiful day today. We got out the the kitty wading pool and. Sammy played in the water, and I sat there in a lawn chair and drank Diet Pepsi and waved to people as they walked past. It's just kind of the way, you know, all this social distancing is working right now, but there you go. So, um, yeah, I wanted to get back in here and finish up the discussion of design patterns, so let's get to it. Uh, pretty short list of things to do today. We're going to do three design patterns, adapter, decorator, and observer. Some of my favorite design patterns, at least they're, I think they're at least interesting, um, no major announcements. Remember the quiz three is coming in on Monday. Make sure that you are writing all the answers in your own words. You could, you're welcome still, of course, to cite anything, but you know, you should take the material and process it and, and, and come back in, in your interpretation of that information. That's the way I know that you've gained experience. I mean, it is an experience system, right? So, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to start doing those Tuesday morning, uh, 11 AM, uh, Q and a sessions live every week. Um, the Zoom link is the same. I've posted in the on the schedule, so you can get to that whenever you need to. Um, I think for my own personal office hours, it's best just to contact me directly. Um, I think me just kind of sitting around trying to be available for a certain amount of time for people to pop in, other than that weekly Q&A session, isn't going to work too well with basically the my situation here at home with sometimes I having to take care of Sammy and sometimes my wife having to teach Spanish for the for her school. So let's just do it by appointment, but just, just contact me. We'll find time. Not a problem. So if you need office hours than me, let me know. Otherwise general questions. I'll do that one time a week, weekly 11 AM Tuesday in zoom. So let's get to it. Um, the adapter pattern is actually going to be in code as opposed to slides. So let's talk about this right now. The basic idea of the adapter pattern is exactly what you think of when you hear the term adapter. Um, here's a good one. This is a barcode scanner, and I brought it home for Technology Tuesdays with Sammy. We're, we're learning about how barcodes work. And it turns out it has a standard USB plug. Ooh, exactly. Um, when I plug it into Mac, my MacBook Pro, my MacBook Pro says, I have no idea to do with this ancient technology. How do you do this? I only work with these fancy USB-C things. So I have a nice USB-C adapter. Of course, it plugs right in there. Hey, look at that. I'm a pro. I did a USB plug on the first try. That's how you know I'm legit. So, it's an adapter. I mean, well, what does this mean as far as code goes? Well, imagine you had a module that outputs CSV. That's handy. Um, but the other module that I have is going to take JSON as an input. Oh, hmm, that doesn't work. I need to find a way to make these two things work together. Well, I could do one of two things, the adapter pattern says. <clears throat> One way is to do basically what I did with that, with that USB device. I build an object that goes in between it and knows how to make a conversion. So I'll make a third object. But because this is code and because if we're using something that can do object orientation, we can make a wrapper around one of them, make a subclass of one of them, and then have it make the conversion for us. So what the adapter pattern says is, depending on what you're trying to do, sometimes it makes sense to make another object, sometimes it makes sense just to do a wrapper around it. Let's look at the code here. So this code is posted with my lecture notes on the website. If you go to the lectures tab and just find ON9, you'll find this code there. And the idea here is I'm trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Ha 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 ha. I know. Uh, the basic idea is that the square peg will continually shrink until it goes through the round hole. The, the, the actual math of what's happening here is kind of irrelevant. Um, what's more important is how are we doing it? So in order to make this very boring square peg class right here that has a side length, and it either will or will not fit. I need to change this make fit function so that it will now um, do the cool thing to make it shrink so that it can go into that round hole. So one option is the class adapter. Now notice this class adapter takes square is, is, a, is a subclass of square peg. So in here, I am going to override the make fit function so that it is going to now, um, you know, reduce it in size appropriately until it gets all the way in. Because by doing this, you know, it does math. It's it's fantastic. So this version is the object-oriented. I'm going to put a wrapper around it. 
This version, the square peg ad uh, object adapter, takes a peg as an input. It is a field. It is something that comes in here. It's setting self.peg equal to peg. So it that this is the, you know, I am taking this as a parameter into that class. That's the that is the um, the object adapter. Now down here, when I make the calls, it, it changes the way the API works slightly, right? So um, the peg adapter here, square peg, square peg class adapter takes the size, the size of 10, because it's a subclass. I'm still creating a peg. But down here, I had to have created a peg of size 10 right here. And then I send that peg in. So the adapter pattern says, if you're using an object-oriented language, pick which one of these makes sense to you. They should, whoops, they should both work. There you go. That's the adapter pattern. So if we go back and look at our types of patterns here, hey, I did it wrong the first try. Um, we talked about a creational uh, pattern, the singleton pattern. I'm not going to talk much about the abstract factory pattern. Um, I'm going to, I'll probably post some code for it. Um, the basic idea behind abstract factory is you build an object that knows how to crank out other objects and knows how to just poof, 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 poof. Um, that could be very useful if you're creating a bunch of connections, for instance, you need to, you know, spawn a whole bunch of connections for a bunch of other objects to connect to. That's where you might want to use that one. Um, the structural, the adapter pattern is the one we just talked about. I'm going to talk about decorator next. Uh, and we're going to do observer. Let me actually vi talk about visitor very, very quickly, just so you have a basic idea of what it is. Um, visitor pattern, do you remember iterators from Java? The idea that you had an array list and you made an object that, know, that knew how to go down the list and look at each thing? That's a visitor. That's a visitor pattern. Visitor pattern says, I'm going to build an object that knows how to traverse a tree, a list, a something, and this is the way you do it. An iterator is an example of that. That's the visitor pattern. So there you go, there's another pattern for you. As you can see, these are things that we do all the time in, in programming. Um, that's why they're patterns. You know, a lot of the most common patterns, you're used to doing this all the time. So get to building a game. Wait, you're gonna do decorator pattern. I know this is actually one of the most common ways that we look at the decorator pattern. So let's assume for a moment we're building a side-scrolling shooter right here. This is radius three, I think it's three. Looks like three. Okay, so we have Gradius three. We have a ship, a player character ship, a, some non-player character enemy ships. Uh, we have power-ups that you pick up, and these power-ups can do various things, like affect your movement, change your weapon type, make your weapon stronger, yada, yada, yada. So we have a bunch of things like that. Now, imagine we were doing this straight up, just normal object-oriented, okay? What are some things that we might have for our ship class? Well, as fields, you might have position, health, everything that has to do with the weapons. And then for, for methods, you might have movement, shoot, get hit, all those sorts of things. But most of the NPCs have that too, right? Because the bad guy ships move and the bad guy ships shoot and they can get hit. Would I be duplicating a lot of code? Here's a more um, extreme example. Um, let's imagine any role-playing game you might think of. We might have a human, a human warrior, and then supreme human warrior, and an elf, and an elf warrior, and supreme elf warrior. Uh, which fields do you put in which class? Do you have a human and an elf? And that's one way of thinking about those classes, those races, and then they're both warriors. So do we put all of the warrior code in warrior or do we put it all in the human class and then you just invoke certain ones if they happen to be a warrior? But what happens when you become a shrimp? How's it? Ah, and this happens a lot, particularly with, with, with systems where we're going to have basically class bloat. We're going to keep adding and adding and adding to our classes, thinking that we need to hold our class for all these different things that we're doing. Could we do it in a model view controller sort of way? Well, okay. How would that work? So the model would be the the data of where the warrior is and the view would be how we just, okay, maybe this pattern isn't the best one. The controller part kind of makes sense though, because we're going to change the way this thing behaves 
in all these different scenarios. So yeah, heavyweight controller that manages all the classes and interactions, the lightweight model, you yeah, know, okay, maybe some basic information about the game object and then some way of drawing it. All right, maybe, maybe there's another way of doing it. Let, let, let's try another example. Let's say we're building um, a coffee shop system, okay? And you have four different types of drink, house, dark roast, decaf, espresso. And then for any of those classes, for any of those instances, you can now add all of those things, milk, soy, mocha, whip. And then at the end, you just want to have one function cost that just tells you the final cost of everything that they're purchasing. And so are each of those a class? Do you have one drink class and then add things to it? Do you have an add on class and there's a bunch of different instances? Are they all subclasses? This is where it comes from. And one thing you might be thinking about is, oh, oh, come on, Sheriff. All you do is you just have, you know, a, a database as information and you pull it out. And that's, that's potentially one way of doing it. But sometimes you need those things to have some functionality too. They're not just data. Um, in this case, they're probably just data, but it's just an illustrative example. So um, one thing we, and this is the example I just told you. So the general solution to this problem overall is called the decorator design pattern. And the idea is, think of a Christmas tree. That's why it's called decorator. Think of a Christmas tree. You have a plain Christmas tree, but my Christmas tree and your Christmas tree are different because we put different things on them. We hang different things on them. We, we, we give them their own character, their own flavor by adding things to it. So um, we have this general decorator object, and then we can hang bits of features to it as we go. So you've probably done this in Java. Um, the idea that you have a reader stream that feeds to another stream that reads to another stream in order to actually just read data. Um, this is actually pretty, pretty common when it came to uh, when they started doing Java IO, they just said, I want something that reads ones and zeros. And then they said, well, no, I, I want it to read characters too. Hung that on there. No, I want it to be able to read from a buffer hung that on there too. So this is the way it would look. You have an input stream that could be a file input stream, byte array, filter, and if it's filter, it's also could, also could be buffered, and you keep kind of layering these things on. Now, I like this example much better because I taught game design and I think this is cool. Entity component system. This is another idea, another uh, architectural design pattern, very much like MVC except it's meant to be an implementation of the decorator design pattern. So the idea is that um, it was created specifically for games, but you can find it in everything else. So the basic idea is an entity component system. An entity is a unique identifier. That is it. It is typically just a number. It's just typically just like a value somewhere stored in uh, a database. And in a game, this could be the player character, it could be a block in a wall, it could be a coin, it could be a power up, it could be a sword, it could be anything. It could be a wall. It's just a number. It's it's a game object. So it has nothing attached to it. So what we do is we hang components on it. Is it going to be something that has health? We hang the health component. Is it something that's going to move? We hang the movement component. Is it something that the player gets to control? The player picks up a controller. Then there's a component that says the player can move this object because it has the player movement connected to it. And so we keep adding each of these things to it, slowly describing what this object should be. Why is this useful? Well, if we make one movement um, component, we can use the same movement component for everything in the world that moves. And we just change some, some parameters to it to say whether they move fast or slow. We only have to write the movement code one time. That's good. Same thing for health. Same thing for hit detection. Same thing for anything else. So all the data goes in the components, all of it. Even such things as like just position, X, Y, and Z, all of that has to go in there because that's the only place data is allowed to live. Um, we do this so that we can completely abstract away um, every piece of possible possible functionality and make it so it's repeatable and reusable. 
So the entity is just a primary key. It's saying that this is the identifier of this object. It is its name. And this is the, how you're going to get a hold of it to make the changes. So the systems though, are the things that say, okay, Everything that has velocity, I want to update all of those at the same time. Everything that has hit detection, collision detection, I want to update all of those at the same time. Anything that has to be drawn on the screen, let me update all those at the same time. For those of you who don't know this, not all game objects are all, are, drip, are drawn on the screen. Things like hit boxes, when it actually detects whether two objects are touching each other, those tend to not follow the exact graphics on the screen. So we, we, we need to do those separately. They might not be drawn. And it turns out that... Uh, depending on the components that you're using, this is one example chart. The rendering system looks for anything that has position, anything that has a sprite, which would be the graphics, and anything that has to interact with the camera, and then does all those. Then for animation, anything that has sprite and an animation tag to it says this sprite's going to change. Physics, control, AI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So every time the game loop fires, every time you're going to draw a new frame on the screen, 60 frames a second, you know, that's what you're aiming for. Um, all of these systems are firing just all the time. And it's because it can do this because the systems know everything on screen that they have to talk to and nothing else. So it allows it to be able to do this. There's some pretty, one of the most popular current, uh, open, well, it's not open, but free game design tools that people use. Unity is completely based on entity component system. Um, it's, a little bit, eh, they do a few weirder things with it, but its core idea is still entity component system. So this is Decorator. Decorator says, instead of making a whole bunch of classes and then trying to figure out how you make subclasses, make like just a placeholder and then hang all the functionality on it. Pretty cool idea. Pretty cool idea. It allows you to add those new beverages, add new anything, add new enemies. All because you have to do is just pick out the right systems, pick out the right components, and put it together. Right. This would be a good time where I'd say any questions, but uh, right. Let's talk about observer pattern. Imagine we had a scoreboard that is updating during the event. A basket is made, touchdown is made, um, point is scored, whatever. Um, there's a lot of different places that want to know that that's happening, right? So CBS Sports, Yahoo, ESPN, our own UVA apps, all these places. So we need to make sure that all of them get the data all at the same time. Super common problem, right? Super, super common problem. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. You could do push or pull. This is the first part of the observer pattern, push or pull. Uh, a push means that the data source, so in our case, John Paul Jones, every time something happened, it would say, Hey, everybody, something's changed. Hey, everybody, something's changed. You know, it, it's pushing the changes out. A pull means that all of those entities are coming back and saying, hey, JPJ, anything new? Hey, JPJ, anything new? Hey, JPJ, anything new? Um, and you can imagine that pull is really, really taxing on the data source because if everyone's constantly asking, it's, nah, I can't handle it all. So we, we only use poll in very specific scenarios. Push is much more common. Let the data tell everyone else when things have, have changed, okay? So the observer pattern says um, the, the, the subject itself has some collection of observers. And that collection of observers is typically like a list of things, okay? And there's a functionality that says, I can register this observer, I can unregister it, or I can notify all my observers. So register means I've added a new thing I need to tell. Unregister means I don't care about them anymore. And then notify means I need to update them. So um, with all these, this, this, I'm pointing at the screen as if you know what I'm pointing at. Let me use a mouse. So this observer, uh, super class here. So concrete observer A could be ESPN. Concrete observer B could be a newspaper or whatever it might be. Okay. Am I out of slides? Oh, I was out of slides. Oh, good. So now let's jump over to the code. Click. Okay. So here's my scoreboard. Okay. Um, first thing I'm going to do is create a set of observers and set the current score to zero. Um, I have attach and dechat, ta, detach, speaking, uh, as my uh, two functions here for adding new observers to my set of observers. And the notify function for every observer in that list, update that observer, okay? And then it has a property of the current score, and then there's a current score setter as, as 
parts of the scoreboard itself. In my observer class uh, sets uh, the subject and the observer state, and then update is coming from, uh, is, is created by the concrete observer. So this is making a subclass of that. So here the scoreboard, a concrete observer is created, a concrete observer two is created of the same class. They both attach themselves to the scoreboard. When I call scoreboard.current score, Notice I only made the, uh, this, is, this is the thing that's firing. Scoreboard.currentScore123, Observer sees the new score. Observer sees the new score. Because um, the Observer.update gets called, when the update gets called, Observer.update for all of those observers. And when it does that, it knows to print the score. Super cool. So in this way, I've created um, some objects that know how to listen for this change, for these push changes, and then can update as they need. So you could use this potentially for, um, you have a uh, an application where you are constantly watching a database or something like that. And whenever that database changes, you need to update a bunch of things on the screen. Or maybe for instance, you are writing a, um, maybe like a local Twitter app and it is getting pushes from the Twitter API whenever a new tweet comes in, then that is being pushed to tell your app to be updated. Maybe you update multiple things in multiple places in your app. There's, this is a pretty common problem, but that's why we have design patterns, right? A design pattern is an accepted solution to a known problem. The architectural design patterns we looked at were for large level things, high level things. How do you put together the entire system? How do you think about the system itself? These design patterns, the software design patterns are all about how do you solve common algorithmic challenges, common you know, problem solving challenges within your system. Being familiar with design patterns is very important for software engineers. There was a, there was a time where we used to tell students you had to memorize X number of design patterns I don't really believe in that. I, I, I think you need to kind of know, hey, look, this is probably something that has a solution. I probably should go look for the solution, not necessarily try to reinvent the wheel. So you should know that it's, it's okay. It's understandable. It, you're supposed to go say, hey, this seems like a solved problem, right? There's probably a pattern out there somewhere. And then once you see the pattern, how do you understand how to implement it? So if you have any questions about design patterns, come join me on Tuesday. Let's talk about it. Um, I hope you're doing well with the quiz. Hope you are having a good weekend. Regardless, make sure you're enjoying the great weather out there. I'm going to go back to my book. Got to get me some more Daniel Tiger. You know. Why not? Hope you're having a good one. Catch y'all later. Bye.